This is an overview of the National Science Olympiad Astronomy Sea event for 2018, which will take place at the Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado on May 18th and 19th. And the topic for 2018 is stellar evolution and type two supernovas. Now this is going to be only just a brief and general overview of the deep sky objects, how they fit into the process of stellar evolution, and the best resources for you to access to prepare for competition. The astronomy event for National Science Olympiad is supported by NASA's Astrophysics Division Universe of Learning uh, through a network that involves the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the National Science um, Competition and uh, the, it has always been supported by Chandra by recording these webinars and posting them on the Chandra website. So this webinar is uh, going to be posted on the Chandra website sometime later on this summer or early fall, uh, as well as the middle school uh, solar system competition. And the webinars are there for since 2013. They've been posted on the Chandra website. So if you go down back through some of those, you will find uh, in the past we have done type two supernovas before, and that would give you some more information on this particular topic. The event description for this year, again, type two, this, this particular competition year 2017, we had type, we focused in on type 1A supernova events. So now we're going for more massive stars. In fact, this year we're sort of concentrating on really massive stars. So I think you're going to really be fascinated with some of these deep sky objects. They're pretty, pretty amazing. In fact, some of them we really don't know an awful lot about yet. We're still in the process of researching the data. The um, resources that you are allowed to bring to this event, again, have not changed. Either a laptop or a three ring binder for each team member. The internet will not be allowed. You cannot access the internet. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit when I talk about JS9. The event description for stellar evolution, so this year, includes things that are specific to type 2 supernova. Um, stellar evolutionary uh, stages such as uh, Cepheids, uh, semi-regulars, the luminous blue variables, the massive hypergiant stars, wolf rayet stars, magnetars, black holes, those kinds of things, of objects. We still have the same mathematical relationships, Kepler's laws, since a lot of these objects are in binary or multiple star systems. We have the distance modulus relating to the Cepheid variables to determine distances to galaxies, and of course Hubble's law um, to calculate distances to galaxies far, far away. So we have 15 deep sky objects this year. Uh, if you arrange those deep sky objects into the type of object that they are, we have two star formation regions, we have four massive stars, there are five type two supernova remnant events. There are three pulsars and there are two binaries, an X-ray binary and a gamma ray binary. Now that does not mean that some of these other objects are not in binary systems because they are. For instance, HR 5171A is also in a binary system, but the most important part of that star is the fact that it's a very rare hypergiant uh, yellow hypergiant, where the two binaries that I've listed at the bottom are identified by their X-ray or gamma ray binary system. So we have the usual graphic of stellar evolution that we use every single year just to show the sequences that we're going to be involved with. This year, of course, we're looking at the top of the sequences where the massive stars lead to type two supernova events, magnetars, pulsars, black holes. And this little, finally, we are going to be dealing directly with this odd little object that's been on this graphic since uh, we started using it many years ago. That is um, supernova 1887A. 
and um, we'll be talking more a little bit about that as we go along because it's celebrated a very important anniversary this year. So looking at the graphic for stellar evolution and looking at it from the more scientific perspective of the HR diagram, we do not have to go into this in, very, in any detail at all because you all should be very knowledgeable about the HR diagram now. Even if you are just competing in high school for the first time this year, you have been, I'm sure, competing at the middle school level for the past two years where the middle school division uh, B event has been Reach for the Stars and the HR diagram was in that competition. So all of you should be very knowledgeable about the HR diagram. You should understand that it, if you plot the two physical characteristics of a star, of its temperature and its absolute brightness, then it tells you what stage of stellar evolution it is, what stages it's gone through previously, and what stage that it's going to be evolving into eventually for its final catastrophic collapse and leaving those stellar objects behind. So looking at the first star formation region, NGC 6357, uh, this is a ground-based image. There are incredible ground-based images anymore. Um, and this one is a, a close-up. This star formation region is 6,500 light years away in the, in the constellation of Scorpius. And if you look close in on one particular portion of this star formation region, you'll find Pismas 24, which is a group of really massive stars. A really bright star there uh, above the nebula itself is actually 200 solar masses. There is a, a group of massive stars here from 100 to 200 solar masses that have uh, recently uh, been formed. Uh, if you back off and look at a wide field of view of this particular star formation region, it's also called a lobster nebula. It looks more like a lobster here. Uh, the ESO, the uh, Very Large Telescope, has produced a 2 million pixel zoomable image of NGC 6357. And when you look at the PowerPoint that's going to be posted on the National Science Olympiad website, um, the link to that zoomable image is on this particular slide. So you need to really look at that. It's pretty spectacular. You can also see this star formation region in, in the optical. This is from the UK, part of the Supercosmos Sky Survey. This is what it looks like in infrared from the Spitzer mission. And this is what it looks like with X-ray data from Chandra and Rosat. And if you put them all together, you have the overall perspective of what this star formation region looks like. The next star formation region, uh, 7822, is just a stunning image of uh, star formation. It has everything involved with star formation in it. You can see the black, opaque, cold molecular clouds where the little clumps of gas and dust where it's cold and the gas and dust starts clumping and forming. What will form eventually protostars. You see the H2 region, the ionized region, where some of those clumps now have gotten hot enough inside for fusion to start, hydrogen to helium fusion. They get more massive. They start producing intense ultraviolet radiation, X-ray radiation. That starts photoevaporating the material away. The cold material, the gas and the dust, starts to dissipate. It sculpts these beautiful pillars of gas and dust. And eventually, many of these objects will become stars, but about 90% um, of them will never become stars because of the radiation from the ma more massive ones forming in their proximity. This is um, another uh, ground-based observation of this same star formation region, again, uh, showing the, the, the clouds of gas and dust, how sculptured and beautiful they are the cold molecular clouds, the H2 regions are very important where the stars are forming these massive stars. You'll be, um, that a lot of that will be part of the competition. Uh, this is an infrared image of the same region taken from NASA's WISE satellite, the Wide Infrared Survey Explorer, again. Another look at the clouds of gas and dust and the ionized region where this, these massive stars are forming right now. 
the um, massive star, our far, first massive star, uh, HR 7151A, is uh, the largest yellow hypergiant detected to date. These are incredibly rare. Because these stars are so massive, they fuse their products so furiously, so fast, that they don't last very long. They have a very short uh, stages in their evolutionary path. So there have only been eight of these detected in the entire Milky Way galaxy. To catch one that's in this hypergiant yellow stage is pretty, pretty rare. They are highly massive, highly luminous. They are ejecting material at a really high rate. They have really high winds coming from, from the surfaces of these stars, pushing all the material away from the, from the center of the, of the stars. And um, again, a really short existence. Uh, this particular star happens to be in a, in a binary system, a contact binary system. It has a companion. There is a 2.8 AU separation between um, the star and, and its companion star, uh, but there's a 10 AU separation from the center of one to the center of the other. Uh, in it, the primary star, it orbits every 1,300 days. So there's a lot of distortion taking place because this star is so massive, but it's a fascinating system. So looking at the system, it's most probably, is it going to go through the luminous blue uh, variable stage, LBV stage? Is it going to become a wolf rayet star? This is the probable scenario for the future of this particular hypergiant. And it also it is, is the or, has an ecliptic orb, uh, an eclipsing orbit uh, with its companion star. So that also is measured. 